Welcome to the Library of Campion Hall, Oxford, uh, both to those of you who are here in person and to all of those who are joining us online. My name is Father Nick Austin. I'm the Master of Campion Hall. And it's a very special pleasure to welcome you today to this very um, significant day in the life of Campion Hall because today, exactly 125 years ago, Father Clark and four Jesuit students arrived in St Giles in Oxford and began the first Jesuit Hall in the University of Oxford. So today at Campion Hall, we celebrate our 125th birthday. So happy birthday to all members of the hall. And today's the first event in a whole series of events as we celebrate for the next year, our anniversary year. It's my pleasure to welcome uh, Professor Jared Kilroy. Um, Jared's deep affection for the Society of Jesus is shown by the fact that he belongs not just to one but two Jesuit institutions, as well as being Senior Research Fellow here in English here at Campion Hall. He's also a professor in uh, the Jesuit University in Krakow in Poland, the Ignatianum. And uh, he'll be talking today about Edmund Campion and War's Household of the Faith. And he's extraordinarily well qualified to do this. Uh, shortly with Oxford University Press, who are publishing the complete works of Evelyn War, um, Gerard will be publishing uh, War's biography of Edmund Campion, a book which is very tied to the history of the hall. And Gerard's uh, introduction and critical commentary will be part of that edition. Uh, we should also remember that uh, uh, Gerard produced in 2016 the very uh, important biography of Edmund Campion himself. Uh, Gerard will speak to us for about 40 to 45 minutes and there'll be time for questions. Those of you who are online, please do... Uh, write in your questions and uh, uh, we'll finish at 6.45 p.m. So, Jared, welcome to you and you uh, we're looking much. forward very much to what you have to tell us about Edmund Campion and War's Household of the Faith. Thank you very, very much. Well, I must say that, just to start, that it's a great honour to be here at the beginning of this um, anniversary year and um, I'm delighted to... to talk about Campion on this occasion and Evelyn War. At tea on Wednesday the 2nd of July 1930, six months after his divorce decree, Evelyn War asked Olivia Plunkett Green, a recent convert, to find a Jesuit to instruct him. She found Father Martin Darcy on the 8th of July, 1930, War called on Darcy at the centre of the English province, Mount Street, which he described as superbly ill-furnished with a ruthless absence of good taste. <laughs> it was a meeting that changed his life and led directly to Edmund Campion. A little more than two months later, at the Church of the Immaculate Conception, Farm Street, which as you know is next door, Darcy received War into the Catholic Church. The failure of War's marriage led to a series of affairs with at least three married women, Joyce Gill, Lady Hazel Lavery, and Claire Mackenzie, long amorous, amorous dalliances with others like Lady Diana Cooper, and a frustrating courtship of the Dutch girl, as he called her, Teresa Jungmann. Darcy, seeing war into what one might call a, sinking into what one might call a life of despondent decadence, invited him in the summer of 1933 to join a large party of Catholics on an Hellenic cruise aboard the SS Maria Krylika. It was an inspired move. Darcy ministered to a remarkable collection of Catholics. You can see some of them uh, here. Laura Lovett, Julian Oxford, Lady Helen Asquith, Hugh Fraser, and many more, Christopher Hollis among them. But the links established with Catherine Asquith and Gabriel Herbert and her family transformed his life. 
Gabriel invited him back to meet her mother, the formidable Mary Herbert, in the house they called Alta Chiara in Portofino, where she pelted him with hard Italian rolls when he was rude about the Irish, but still invited him to Pixton Park. On the cruise, war fell under the spell of Catherine Asquith, who felt that his skills as a writer were being wasted and her view began to influence both his conduct and his writing. When A Handful was, of Dust was published in September 1934, she told him that, brilliant as it was in its way, it made her so, so miserable reading about people like Brenda who aren't worth satirizing. She consoled herself with the thought that Campion is coming. War first met Laura Herbert in Portofino after the cruise, but it was only at Pixton Park in Christmas 1934, a year later, that he wrote that he had taken a great fancy to her. Quotation, only 18 years old, virgin, Catholic, quiet and astute. He had to win the approval of her mother and his credentials as a Catholic suitor were not good. On the cruise, Christopher Hollis, aware of Evelyn's misery over his inability to marry again in his adopted church, encouraged him to apply for an annulment. Darcy prepared the papers, an intimate task. So by now, war was even more indebted to him. But the application, far from winging its way to Rome as everyone thought, sat on a shelf in Westminster, gathering dust, for three years. In January 1933, Darcy was made master of Campion Hall, the first Catholic institution to return to Oxford since the Reformation. It was still occupying the building it had leased in 1896 under, as you heard, Father Richard Clarke, a graduate and fellow of St. John's, a convert who had entered the society in 1871. As was the custom, the hall took the name of each of the masters, Clark, Pope, and Plater, until in 1918, it was finally granted the status of permanent private hall and allowed to call itself Campion Hall. The lease was due to run out in 1936. Darcy was unimpressed by the plans drawn up by the previous master for a new hall to be built on the adjoining property in St. Giles, and asked his friend, Francis Lady Horner, for advice. She recommended Sir Edwin Lutyens, who told Darcy that he would be happy to work for a reduced fee, I think an essential part of these negotiations. Darcy invited him to choose from three available sites in Oxford, and he plumbed, as you know, for Brewer Street, which included a disused garage that had once housed horses for Oxford trams, and a ramshackle Micklem Hall. £30,000 had to be found for the building, and War offered to help by writing a life of Gregory the Great. Darcy suggested that Edmund Campion would be a more suitable subject. So the book, like the hall itself, has to be classed as one of the best objets Darcy. Darcy accompanied his suggestion with the offer of all the help war needed from the Jesuit archives. Catholic historiography, following the lead of the great archival historian John Lingard, was committed to correcting, as it saw, three centuries of Reformation history. Leo Hicks, Jesuit historiographer, put at war's disposal all the notes accumulated by his formidable predecessor, John Hungerford Pollen, who was clearly intending to write a biography of Campion, every part of whose story was contested. For example, a publication of a major source for Elizabethan history, Hollinshed's Chronicles, was halted on the 1st of January, 1587, so it could be censored. One whole sheet four pages containing Campion's trial and execution was excised 
and replaced by a single leaf. We know that the sheets were already printed and fold, folded, as I was able to prove from the copy in Trinity College Dublin. Uh, the worms had gone straight through the pages, uh, but the pages that had been taken out to be censored, uh, the worms had had a field day on those. And so you could tell the difference. And clearly this page, uh, this whole sheet was never taken out. I think Abraham Fleming was very, very annoyed uh, at the censorship. After Catholic emancipation in 1829 and the restoration of the hierarchy in 1850, the cause of canonization began on the 19th of June, 1874, identifying 316 martyrs worthy of veneration. On the 29th of December, 1886, Pope Leo XIII beatified 54 of these, including Thomas More, John Fisher, and Edmund Campion, with a decree entitled Anglia Sanctorum Insula, England, Island of the Saints. Nine more in 1895 and a further 136 in 1929. So from 1874 to the 25th of October 1970, when Campion and the other 40 martyrs were canonized, a line of distinguished Jesuit historians based at Mount Street, John Morris, John Hungerford Bollen, Philip Caraman, James Walsh, Clement Tigger, supported by men like Henry Foley and Leo Hicks, were involved in assembling the 500 or so historical documents as evidence. War came to Campion, therefore, not just through the lens of Jesuit historiography, but the passionate pursuit of the cause. He finished writing Edmund Campion in May 1935, the very month John Fisher and Thomas More were canonized. The cause was interrupted by the war, but the cause of the 40 martyrs, now called simply Sanctorum Insula, formally restarted by 1961, when the third edition of Campion was being published, and two of War's daughters were already working at Mount Street with Father Caraman. Margaret, he wrote to Nancy Midford, now works in London, canonizing 40 martyrs at 10 pounds a week. <laughs> War may have got dust on his tweed suit from the files at Stonyhurst, and I want to pay tribute here to the wonderful Father Freddie Turner, who was an archivist there for 33 years and definitely had dust on his suit. But he was also infected by the enthusiasm felt across the English Catholic community for our martyrs. To the church of Augustine, Edward the Confessor, and Thomas of Canterbury, he added in the proofs in July 1935, shortly after the canonization, Thomas More. If the book began in the archives, it emerged in Champagne at the opening of Campion Hall on the 26th of June, 1936. War is on the steps smiling because two days earlier, he had received the Hawthornden Prize for a work of imaginative literature by a British author under 41. And I just want to linger a couple of moments on some wonderful photographs. Uh, this is the um, guest list, or part of the guest list, the page that includes war, as you see, guest number 100. And it also has a unique uh, table plan, which is organized alphabetically. So even in war is on table W, and <laughs> Uh, everybody else is on the table appropriate to their letter of the alphabet, except very important people like heads of houses who have an X next to their name because they're obviously on the top table. Um, and the flavor of the event can be seen from this wonderful slide of Darcy gesticulating, the Duke of Alba looking faintly embarrassed, and Lindsay looking, the vice chancellor looking very amused. The citation for the Hawthornden Prize 
brushes aside the history and focuses on the success of portraying the inner life of Campion himself, where we know it said what he would die for and what he prayed for. Within five years, two more Catholic converts won the Hawthornden Prize, David Jones within parenthesis in 1938 and Graham Greene with The Power and the Glory in 1941. Um, I think it's very, very interesting, the connections between The Power and the Glory and Brideshead Revisited. Not obvious pair at all, but I think they are linked in, in theme. We might come back to that in questions. The picture on the steps, therefore, marks a moment in the history of a resurgent Catholicism. Between 900, no, sorry, between 1900 and 1960, there were 746,000 converts to Catholicism. I, I make that about 12,000 a year. Many of them distinguished writers and artists. Maurice Baring in 1909, Eric Gill in 1913, Ronald Knox in 1917, David Jones in 1921, G.K. Chesterton in 1922, Graham Greene in 1926, Alfred Noyes, 27, Evening War, 1930, Frank Packnam, 1940, Siegfried Sassoon in 1957. When Edith Sitwell was received, War, who acted as her godfather, wrote to her on the 9th of August, 1955, how one welcomes converts. He added that he had just heard a sermon on the dangers of immodest bathing dresses and thought that you and I were innocent of that offense at least. A few days later, he sent a copy of Edmund Campion to Alec Guinness on his conversion. When he sent a copy to Elizabeth Lady Longford on her conversion in 1946, she thanked him for giving her what she had longed for and what she, he thought she would, what she thought she would never get, a really warm feeling for the church and her heroes, comparable, I suppose, in strength to my logical conviction that she was right. I, I'm putting these um, instances of reception in just to really complement the picture of the official reception in reviews. Uh, one doesn't really get any idea of the impact of the book uh, from those, but one gets a very strong Im uh, impression from the letters uh, of various people to him. One of these, uh, a group of one of these letters, uh, comes from a Polish Jesuit, Prince Henryk Lubomirski, an Oxford friend and contemporary. And he wrote to war, and these are beautiful letters in the British Library, typed on both sides of airmail, that airmail blue uh, sheets of the period to express his gratitude and to describe the effect of the book on the novices he was teaching at Kalish. The novices, he said, listened enraptured at the description of that scene where after mass, just before dawn, there is a great silence while the priest disrobes, people kneeling here and there about the room, the candles snuffed through the windows one can see on the pale morning sky the tips of the fern trees in the garden, and then suddenly the noise of hoofs in the courtyard, the priest galloping off to the next house where that night he will say mass. The book taps into a romantic view of Catholic priest martyrs that goes back to Robert Hugh Benson's Come Rack, Come Rope, and is continued in Caraman's translation of John Gerard's autobiography of an Elizabethan. 1951. Even if the historical assessments of Edmund Campion contain questionable bias about the established church, which War anachronistically calls Anglican, War successfully portrayed Campion as a chivalric, affectionate, and courageous knight errant who died defending his church with panache and courage. It's a Jesuit tradition that goes back to Ignatius himself and his passion for the same chivalric romances that Don Quixote parodied, Amadeus de Gaulle, for example. Clement Tigger, who directed Jesuit formation for nearly 40 years, first at Manresa College, Roehampton, and then at Campion House in Osterley, 
wrote to War on July the 26th, 1949, that he had just heard it read in the repertory for the twelfth time, and knew at least four persons who became Catholics as a result of reading your book. But the person most affected by Edmund Campion was War himself. All royalties from the book, which won him his only prize, went to Campion Hall, whose Liber Benefactorum records over £1,200 of donations from the various editions and translations. And you see here, there, it's mostly from the American uh, edition of 1946, uh, but it also includes a German translation. Um, there was actually a pre-war uh, German ed uh, translation in 1939, amazingly. And this is a second page from that. So it's not surprising that War had a special affection for the book. It made him a member of the Campion Hall community, gave him, as it were, an armchair in the household of the faith, and coincided with the news on the 7th of July, 1936, that his annulment had finally been granted. War looked back with nostalgia at the glittering diversity of guest nights at Campion Hall in the 1930s, many of which he had attended, in the piece he wrote for the tablet immediately after the war. And this is the manuscript which is held here. For this decade, Catholicism enjoyed a brief period of intellectual and social celebrity. Darcy joined the Poetry Society, whose members included Auden, Stephen Spender, Louis McNeese, and Cecil Day-Lewis. Augustus John and Eric Gill were close friends of Darcy, and Quentin Hogg and Edith Sitwell were frequent visitors at the hall. A.J. Eyre claimed that Darcy's class on Aquinas was one of the few he attended for pleasure. Darcy also became a close friend of Ronald Knox, the university chaplain at this time. Knox refused to use a telephone, so messages to him had to come via Darcy and be carried through the garden into the old palace on Rose Lane. Often, these two popular orators were invited to speak together in the Oxford Union. The period when Knox and Darcy were together at Oxford was a golden age for Catholicism in the university. And Edmund Campion, sorry, this is a mysterious slide which disappears. There. Uh, but there's something in the slide that makes it uh, vanish. Uh, Edmund Campion gave war a key role in that brief flowering, much more than the walk-on part in this sketch by Charles Marnie. Apparently, Charles Marnie was sketching the garden, and Evelyn War walked into it, complete with hat and stick, so Marnie included him uh, in, in the sketch. But it's on wartime paper, and as I say, that something very odd happened with the photograph. I, when I transferred it to the slide, it, it, it disappeared, and then appears again when you show it. Between 1935, when the first edition appeared, and 1946, when the first American edition came out, a profound change occurred in War's own understanding of Campion's life. The changes he made, or tried to make, to all subsequent editions, down to the beautiful third edition of 1961, transformed the book from a confessional study of an Elizabethan martyr to a study of the unending war between an eternal church and an oppressive state. Three things precipitated that change, Mexico, Croatia, and friendship with Graham Greene. Mexico gave material form to War's developing image of the church. In 1938, he visited the country shortly after Greene, whose The Lawless Roads, a study of the persecuted church flourishing underground in Mexico, profoundly influenced him. War, like Green, was shocked by the brutality of the regime, 
but impressed by the courage still evident in 1938, but originating in 1926, when President Plutarco Calles began burning churches and executing more than a hundred priests. Green, who had himself been moved by War's portrait of Campion, which he reviewed for The Spectator in November 1935, began his account of the Mexican church with the return of the Jesuit, Father Miguel Pro, to his native Mexico on the 7th of July, 1926, three weeks before a new law closed all churches and banned religious worship. Miguel Pro carried out his priestly ministry in secret. Like Campion, he was in disguise when he landed, a dark lounge suit, soft collar and tie, a bright cardigan. You can see the cardigan in the picture here. And he survived for just over a year before being arrested. After a manifestly unjust trial, he was sentenced to death by firing squad on the 23rd of November, 1927, an event which Calles invited the press to photograph. The young Jesuit refused a blindfold, insisted on first kneeling to pray, and died standing with his arms outstretched, still wearing his trademark suit and bright cardigan, and shouting, Viva Cristo Rey. The press photographs, the earliest photographic record of a Catholic martyrdom, were first promulgated by the communist state and then, when venerated, banned as contraband icons. Green reproduced them, as you see here, in the lawless roads. Green was the first to set Campion and Father Pro side by side, arguing that Miguel Pro came back to his own country, much as Campion returned to England from Douai, and that the totalitarian state always behaves the same way in the time of Elizabeth and England just as much as in Mexico. War's own sense of totalitarian oppression was enhanced when in Croatia at the end of 1944, correcting the proofs of Brideshead revisited, he began chronicling the suppression of the church. His long, passionate denunciation of communism, church and state in liberated Croatia, presented to Anthony Eden in March 1945, was quietly filed away in a bottom drawer at the Foreign Office. Tito, like Stalin, was now Britain's ally. And Captain War, our man in Belgrade thought, was biased. When his appeal on behalf of Catholics in Croatia was rejected, War took aim at the policies of Marshal Tito in a letter to the Times in 1945, where he claimed that the church is subject to persecution aimed at its extinction that great numbers of priests whose only offence was popular esteem have been done to death, religious houses closed, and religious associations abolished. Challenged for evidence, War replied in a second letter on the 5th of June, 1945, that in Sibonik, eight priests were killed, in Split, 10, in Dubrovnik, 14, in the Franciscan province of the Redeemer, 23, in Mostar, 45. In 1952, when Tito was invited on an official visit to England, War wrote a passionate condemnation of all Tito's works, the invitation itself and the bland indifference shown when Christianity is at stake and the younger generation are being driven from their faith with all the specialised mechanism of modern statesmanship. These experiences changed War's perception of Edmund Campion. He wrote in February 1946 an entirely new preface for the first American edition, which is as beautiful a piece of prose as the end of Brideshead, with which it's strongly linked in tone and imagery. And you can see in the last paragraph there, I'm just going to read the last uh, four line, five lines of that. We've seen the church driven underground in one country after another, the martyrdom of Father Pro in Mexico reenacted campions. In fragments and whispers, we get news of other saints in the prison camps of Eastern and Southeastern Europe, of cruelty and degradation more frightful than anything in Tudor England, and of the same pure light shining in the darkness, uncomprehended. The hunted, 
trapped, murdered priest is amongst us again, and the voice of Campion comes to us across the centuries as though he were walking at our side. If this is not evidence enough of War's passion on this subject, he also turned down the publisher's text for the front cover flap. The back cover was on Brideshead, and insisted on a new text. His revised version, returned to Little Brown on the 19th of April 1946, is even more explicit than the last paragraph of the preface, and clearly reflects the two days he had spent on the 1st and 2nd of April 1946 at the Nuremberg trial of Ribbentrop, where he heard of the lethal pact of communism with fascism on the 23rd of August 1939, which had consigned Poland to destruction by the men war called two indistinguishable louts, and Czesław Miłosz, the two accomplices. I'll just look at the last paragraph. We are nearer Campion's day than when this book was written. The hunted and martyred priest, political police, mock trials, the attempt to di identify divergence of faith with treason to the state are now commonplace in half the world. The book can be read today with a new significance and new encouragement. One of the most interesting aspects of working on the OUP edition has been to try to show the development of the text from the first edition in 1935, which has many errors and is cluttered with terrible notes and a shameful bibliography, to the beautiful American edition of 1946, blissfully free of both of these and enhanced by the eloquent preface. The second English edition of 1947 was a catastrophe. Unable to print, Hollis and Carter lithographed the text, so they failed to follow War's instructions to cut the notes and bibliography and had to insert corrections into the text, as you can see clearly here. Worst of all, they introduced errors which then clung like limpets to the text of all later English editions. The hunted priest of the preface became the haunted priest. And Luke Gunning, a Catholic canon of Winchester, became improbably a canon of Windsor. And the typographical information that you can see reproduced here was reduced to nonsense, the E, being turned into E. Hollis and Carter tried to improve the edition with photographs, but nothing could make up for this slipshod editing. When Penguin asked to publish in 1953, War insisted he had long been greatly ashamed of the notes to Campion, that he had scamped them at the time and should greatly prefer to see them out in, cut entirely. In 1961, he told John Guest of Longmans that he was delighted with the new edition, which was free of notes and bibliography, and in War's own view, was better even than the first, and far better than the 1947 edition. With a woodcut by Reynolds Stone, most of the earlier areas corrected, gold lettering on red board, this was at last what War wanted, a beautiful book to give away at convent prize givings. One of the errors in the first edition, only partially corrected later, concerned the number of copies of the original Rationes Decem that were extant. It was printed, you remember, in an attic at Stoner Park. For bibliographic details, War was completely dependent on John Hungerford Pollen, who had on seen only the Stonyhurst copy and knew of two other copies, one with the Marquis of Butte and the other in the care of Canon Luke Gunning of Winchester. In 1936, a member of Campion Hall discovered a fourth copy in the six-minute box of a bookseller. And in 1948, War had this beautifully bound, as you see here in this wonderful photograph by Colin Dunn. There was all this time unknown to War a fifth copy then in Bamburgh Castle and now in Durham University Library. 
A few years ago, I asked Luke Gunning's successor, Canon Paul Townsend of Winchester, if it was true that he had found a new copy. He told me he'd been keeping it in his sock drawer and that the bishop, Crispian Hollis, had just told him to entrust it to the Bodleian. Uh, in fact, uh, this is the only copy still in its original binding, a superb example of what book historians call benign neglect. Uh, and you can see what is really interesting from this, and Henry helped me look at this some years ago, uh, is that the book was stab-stitched uh, by the Oxford binder, famous Oxford binder, Roland Jenks, uh, using parchment for a cheap uh, binding. And in fact, the parchment used in this case is a lease of the Bellamy, to the Bellamy family of Harrow, of property originally belonging to the St. John Hospital uh, in Clerkenwell. It appears that some copies, perhaps a hundred, were bound in Southwark, and that we know this from the uh, journeyman, the angry journeyman of Jenks who betrayed the, the building. And the binding of this one is an old lease of the Bellamy family where Campion, Parsons, Bristow, Robert Southall, and William Weston, and perhaps many other priests all stayed. And I think that suggests strongly that the, um, this is one of the Southwark uh, books. Campion himself was clearly fascinated by books. His father was a printer who had published, as Peter Blaney discovered some years ago, an anti-Catholic book about 1549, uh, News from Rome. And he grew up in Paul's churchyard, the center of the printing trade. There you can see uh, the name of Edmund Campion Sr. at the uh, end of this book. The title page of the Rationes Decem is a masterpiece for a book produced by seven men in the attic of Stoner Park. Uh, it's very elaborate. Uh, I don't think you'd think of doing this unless you knew your way around uh, the print room. Uh, and um, you can see this in the copy that's been cut and trimmed uh, for the, the edition here, which War had uh, bound. Uh, but again, you can see, look at the um, initial letter there, decorated initial letter. And one of the remarkable features of this book is that the marginal glosses uh, are elaborately differentiated. So the Bible and patristic sources are in italics. Uh, Luther, Melanchthon, uh, Calvin, and Beza only get Roman for their notes. Um, it's appropriate that Campion Hall has two books belonging to Campion. A copy of the two commentaries on Aristotle printed in Venice in the 1480s and bound together, we think, by an Oxford binder. And carrying Campion's signature, you can see it there at the top of the page. Uh, the name at the bottom is inscribed by somebody else. Uh, and there's another inscription uh, at the beginning of the book on the front fry leaf. Uh, there's no title page, obviously, for these incunables. You just get uh, um, a sort of colophon uh, at the end of the Janduno on page 185, folio 185. And the hall also possesses, oh, there's, there's interestingly, the, while photographing it, the um, watermark was spotted here, which seems to belong to books found in Venice in the 1480s. Uh, but the hall also possesses, and it's probably it's one of its treasured possessions, the summer which Campion either purchased or acquired in uh, August 1571 uh, when he went to Douai. And uh, this edition has uh, been all around the houses. It has to be said it was at Manresa College originally and went to Heathrop. Uh, in Oxfordshire and then Heathrop in uh, London and um, was rescued by Father James Hanby who brought it back here and it's been uh, beautifully rebound. 
um, and digitized. So you can see that, read the first volume on the Bodleian uh, website, thanks to our librarian, Wilma Minter's um, efforts. But it's a beautiful uh, book, as you can see uh, here. Edmund Camus' last moments on the triangular scaffold at Tyburn on the 1st of December 1581 were as dramatic as any Elizabethan tragedy. When an anonymous minister asked Campion to pray in English, he defended his use of Latin. The minister, willing him to say, Christ have mercy upon me or some such prayer, so Campion, looking back with a mild countenance, humbly said, you and I are not one in religion. Wherefore, I pray you content yourself. I bow none of prayer, only I desire them of the household of faith to pray with me in mine agony and to say one creed. Campion's phrase for the church is found in four Tudor translations of St. Paul's letter to the Galatians, where the Greek is malista de prostus aikeus tes pisteus, William Tyndale was the first to use the phrase, the household of faith, and he was followed by the Great Bible, 1539, the Geneva Bible, 1560, and by Gregory Martin, Campion's closest friend in 1582, who calls the church the household of the faith. Campion's use of the phrase apparently lodged in War's imagination as an image of the Catholic Church since the manuscript of the first draft of Brideshead Revisited, written at Chagford, February to June 1944, carries the draft title, A Household of the Faith, a theological novel, uh, followed by the epigraph, in a quotation incorrectly remembered from the Latin Vulgate version of Hebrews, non enim habemus hic manentem civitatem. Here we have no abiding city. I discovered this when I was trying to compare the bindings. He bound all his manuscripts beautifully, uh, and I wanted to see whether any of them had a privileged, and I discovered this uh, original draft title. If Brideshead is not just an ancient house and an aristocratic Catholic family under strain, but an image of the Bride of Christ struggling and for much of the novel failing to keep the faith in a darkened world, the significance of the peroration in the epilogue becomes clear. Brideshead ends with a pion of praise for the victory of grace over the limited aims of human builders. Something quite remote from anything the builders intended has come out of their work. Three words dominate the last two pages of Brideshead, builders, stones, and flame. So while the fountain may temporarily be full of cigarette ends and dry till the rain fills it. The river Bride will continue to flow and the light of Christ, the Bride's head, will continue to burn. A small red flame, a beaten copper lamp of deplorable design, relit before the beaten copper doors of a tabernacle, the flame which the old knights saw from their tombs, which they saw put out, that flame burns again for other soldiers far from home, farther in heart than Acre or Jerusalem. It was the spectacular success of Brideshead in the United States that prompted War to press for the first American edition of Edmund Campion, a book now representing for him the unending war between the corrupt, transient city of man and the eternal city of God. War dated the end of the manuscript of Brideshead by the liturgical calendar, Eve of Corpus Christi, 1944. That date was the 7th of June, one day after D-Day, an event about which Captain War was silent. In February 1946, when he wrote the preface, the same pure light in darkness connected the two books, and the original title links Campion's scaffold utterance with the very conception of Brideshead. If Campion began as an act of pietas, it became, now by 1946, the cornerstone of War's future writing. 
the struggles of the church in Mexico and Croatia, the refracted horrors of the Nuremberg trials, and the Stalinist domination of Eastern Europe made war see the church, fallible as it was, confronting a far greater darkness and is destined to ultimate victory. Riddled with the imperfections of human beings, its incarnational essence was nonetheless the eternal light of the word, uncomprehended in a world that was all too conscious of the darkness of the death camps and the enveloping horror of the communist state. Brideshead, 1945, Helena, 1950, Men at Arms, 1952, The Holy Places, 1952, Officers and Gentlemen, 1955, Ronald Knox, 1959, and Unconditional Surrender, 1961, all reflect a theological preoccupation that sprang, like the River Bride, from the experience of writing Campion, overseeing changes to its text and sharing as a result not just in the hospitality of Campion Hall, but in the eschatological hope of its spiritual mission. It's appropriate that in 1959, in the roof of the house where he was captured, you can see it here, Life at Grange, was discovered an unusually large Arnus Dei. And this extraordinary photograph by Colin Dunn, uh, I think, brings out the features of this large wax tablet. I, I don't know of any other that's quite as large as this. Um, and it was issued in the seventh year of Pope Gregory XIII, which I make to be um, 1579. The lamb is carrying the flag of St. George, apparently, and lying on a very large book, with, complete with clasps. It's almost as if it was made for Campion. Campion was the only one of the three priests captured in Life at Grange to have come from Rome. The other two had both been in England some time. And this wax tablet is a good symbol of his passionate desire to preach the gospel and, in his words, to cry alarm spiritual against foul vice and proud ignorance, wherewith many, my dear countrymen, are abused. Thank you very much. Jared, thank you so much for that uh, extraordinarily rich uh, narrative. I've rarely heard um, a story of how persons, books, institutions, their narratives are so intertwined across time, across different biographies, persons, and even world circumstances. And it's an incredibly rich tapestry of narrative, the heart of which is this remarkable book by, uh, by Evelyn Waugh uh, that you've weaved for us. So thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, let me turn now to the people who are here in, uh, in the library here in, in Campion Hall for any initial responses and questions. And again, if anyone uh, looking online uh, would like to post a question, please do, and we'll get around to those in a moment. I think everyone's a little bit stunned by the, <laughs> no, the wealth all. of what you've shared with us. Henry, I'm sure you will. Yes, uh, could, thank you very much indeed, Gerald. That's very, very interesting. And I learned a great deal of the writing of Mary um, from it and was reminded of, of things I've forgotten as well, which is always very pleasing. It, it, the manuscript, is there a manuscript of Henry? There is a manuscript yes. of, of, of the book. What, is that a costume? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And, and, and the proof copy you showed us that had the edition of Thomas More. Yes. Where's that? That's also at Austin. Austin. Yes. And, and do you know that, that proof copy's history? Please? Well, it's got a couple of dates in it, uh, put in presumably by one of the editors, and there, there are, I can't remember the exact date of July, but there are two July dates of 1935, which fits, uh, because it had to be before he left for um, Abyssinia in August. So... Um, 
it, it fits the very tight schedule he must have had. But uh, it's, he's put quite a lot of corrections in, in ink, in the margins, um, and, and you know, picked up quite a few um, errors. Though, of course, some like the Silesian and Silesian one, he, he didn't pick up till the penguin noticed it for him, actually. Um, but the, the manuscript, I, I regretted very much that there was a manuscript, actually, because it had so many corrections per page. And um, I just wish he'd, you know, it had been lost somewhere. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, I mean, it does, it did show, I think what, what it revealed to me, I don't know what you felt with a handful of dust, but I, I felt that it showed that the, this you know, smooth and elegant style which one encounters in the book was something that took a great deal of effort to reach, and that was something that I, I thought was worth uh, showing. Yes, I think I think I think um, I, I'd say exactly the same about a handful of dust, um, and that the effort he put into writing and rewriting and copying out yes. copies yes. and correcting the fair copies, even within the manuscript. Uh, absolutely. Any idea that he just sat down. And and amusing sentences and um, how is this going to develop? Yes. Um, is, is wrong, I think. Yes. And, and there's also a proof of a handful of dust, which is at Austin. And right. That shows that he, he gave up um, correcting the proof after <laughs> about 50 or 60 pages and was a very bad proofreader. Ah, right. Which is, but yes. It doesn't make the sort of additions. I was rather struck by the addition of Thomas Hall, which you, you explained very well. He yes. doesn't make those sorts of additions and changes to the proof of, of a handful of dust. No. And I think he must have he must have felt, perhaps, uh, I wonder whether you would agree with, 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 with the proof of Edmund Campion that it needed more attention still, that it was in an unright state when it came to be. Well, I think it's, it's very surprising to me that he didn't pick up these errors that were put in, for example, in the 1947 edition, which he knew was a bad edition. And yet when uh, Penguin produced their edition, all he did was insist that the notes and bibliography stay out of it. And it was only thanks to Glover that, at Penguin that uh, he noticed the Silesian, Silesian mistake and other things like that. But um, when it came to the beautiful third edition, which I think is, is by far the best, um, he didn't pick up the haunted priest. Uh, so that has stayed. And, um, you know, I was quite glad to be able to correct that, at least, <laughs> uh, finally. Um. Just for the benefit of uh, those watching online, that's a conversation between Gerard and Professor Henry Woodhausen, who's uh, publishing a handful of dust with OUP and part of the same uh, complete works of Evelyn War, so we're lucky and, to hear that conversation. Barbara Cook is also editing two um, Evelyn War editions, um, A Little Learning and Gilbert Pinfold. Yes, yes. that's right. <laughs> um, yeah, it's it's funny what you were saying about the, um, you wish that we didn't have the manuscripts. Yeah, I mean, sometimes you think, oh, oh great, we've discovered another manuscript. Oh, that's more work. And you, you actually showed a beautiful kind of clear script. Um, oh. Hello. Um, saying you showed a very clear copy of his um, hospita Hospitality of Campion Hall, and I was sort of looking very wistfully at how clean that was compared to yes. what we have to deal with. I was thinking there's something so interesting going on with time in the way, in both in your talk and in the way War looked at this book in particular. And, and I think actually it's part of the essence of his faith in a way that things that happened in the future shed retrospective light on things he'd discovered and thought about before. That was very clear in the way you picked up his experience of the Nuremberg trial and how it affected his um, cover copy for the first American edition, 1946. Yes, yes. Um, it really reminds me of some of the things I've seen him write about the experience of the mass and how when the mass is said, it's always the time of the present. Um, and I th I wonder if there's something going on for him in the way he's viewing Edmund Campion and his work on that as something that is continually present, um, if that's not too theological. No, no, I think that's right. I mean, I think that, that dating of, of the 
manuscript of uh, Brideshead is very, very interesting. That I mean, he dates it by the liturgical calendar. Uh, I mean, at a time of a, you know one of the most significant events in European history, and uh, I think that it's it's interesting that he misses that out, and that's where I think that the the link with Graham Greene is very, very interesting because it, it really, I, I must say, I never thought of the power and the glory and Brideshead revisited as having any similar features. But as soon as you look beneath the surface, or, you know, aristocratic household, Mexican whiskey priest, and you start to look at the theme, uh, it's, it's very, very similar. You know, the human fallibility, prevalence of grace. And Michael Brennan points out in his wonderful article on, on the two men, um, the power and the glory ends not with the, just with the death of the whiskey priest, but the priest who arrives at the door and knocks on the door and the boy opens his, come on in further. Um, and you know that the church's continual mission is, is carrying on. I think that was for both men a very you know, very different men, as they acknowledged in their correspondence. Uh, I actually, the, one of the other things that I found, I don't know about you, but the uh, most m moving part of doing this was working on the letters in the British Library. Um, and, you know, looking at the sheer volume of letters to him, a very faithful correspondence, like the Ligon sisters and so on, uh, but also many, many letters thanking him for gifts of books or encouragement. And, you know, it's not the public picture of war that people have, but when you look beneath him, to Lubomirsky, for example, he was sending books, which must have been quite a difficult labor in those days in, into Poland, um, and really important to Lubomirsky. Um, so anyway, yes. It's, Well, thank you very much, Gerard, um, uh, for such a fascinating paper. Um, I, I, um, uh, I was very moved by um, what you had to say about its being um, felt to be such a powerful confessional statement um, uh, 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 among uh, his Catholic peers, and um, well, peers in more than one sense, many of them, um, and, um, uh, uh, and, and the way it spoke to contemporary um, Catholic um, persecution. Um, but um, of course, when the book was published, um, uh, it was intervening in an English literary milieu where uh, Catholics didn't automatically get an easy ride. Um, and uh, uh, whether because um, uh, uh, there was, the climate was becoming increasingly secularised um, or because um, uh, uh, the um, various literary lions and lionesses who reviewed were of different confessional sympathies themselves. I'm thinking, um, you know, from somebody like Rose Macaulay, um, f a famous Anglican, um, and, um, and or uh, whether uh, um, people were um, simply anti-Christian. Um, and um, one often gets this impression um, uh, uh, of war that, um, that, uh, that, uh, that confessional sympathies somehow um, uh, uh, somehow marred his writing to set, uh, well to set against the, uh, the, um, the, the picture you're giving um, of um, uh, um, uh, of how um, for, for many that was the best thing. Um, and um, I suspect it's always going to be a split in the way people read war. Um, and uh, I was wondering um, how, you, uh, how you saw that um, played out in contemporary reviews. Well, yes, I mean, there was this long cor uh, correspondence with the listener, wasn't there, which uh, was very, very um, bitter and acerbic. Uh, and uh, I, I think you're, you're right that the... And I think my own sense is that he himself came to realize that that wasn't the best part of the book. I mean, the, the Hawthornden Prize is very tactful, but essentially it's saying, you know, the historical part is biased, but we'll pass over that because what's interesting in the book is the portrait of Campion. And I think that that, in a way, is what still carries the, the, the book through. It's, uh, I mean, I tried actually, 
I remember one pleasant afternoon in Oxford reading the book virtually through in one go, and it's actually a very good book to read at a single or two sittings um, because of the drive and energy that it's got, and the drive and energy coming from Campion himself. I think what he has to say about what he calls the Anglican Church or the Anglicans, uh, which is you know, completely inappropriate in this period, um, is uh, biased. And, and uh, all, as you say, the, the hostile reviews that came uh, picked up that. And uh, there was a Kinsit, the Protestant Truth uh, Society, and so on. Um, but, but I think that what still carries it, and I met somebody here actually who said that she came from a family where uh, her mother gave this book as a present, I can't remember, it was on the 18th birthday of each uh, of the children. Um, so I think it, it, in many Catholic families it had that kind of status and uh, letters from Darcy and Clement Tigger, like the one I read, uh, all give examples of, of that impact. So I think that, in a way, I think it is possible, and I concentrated obviously on that, the best part of it, this, this portrait of Campion. And I think, you know, for having slogged my way through a biography over uh, five or six years, uh, I couldn't get over the fact that war did it all in six months. <laughs> and, and that he got so many things right. I mean, he, that he got you know, several things wrong, and he omitted several really important parts. I mean, he starts Campion's life in Oxford as if he'd sort of sprung into from some platonic conception. Uh, but, you know, in a way, the, the sources he had available didn't provide much uh, information on London. You know, there are only two pages in Simpson and uh, two pages in Parsons, actually. So it's a long tradition of people not knowing much about his London background. Prague is the same. It's six pages. And uh, Simpson gets over the Prague uh, issue by uh, printing the, his letters in entirety. Uh, letters, many letters which exist in copy letters still now in Mount Street. When I went to see them uh, with Father Freddie Turner, they were in a single buff folder in Stonyhurst. I wonder, um, I mean, I'm nothing against hagiography, quite the contrary. Um, I wonder if what bothered people about, um, um, about War's book was that it was more mixed than hagiography, uh, that they didn't quite know how to categorise it. Well, I think that's right, and that's why I'd, I tried to bring in the context of the canonisation, mm. because I think it, it's only then you can understand you know, where in the, in the cliche of war is coming from, that it's coming partly from the, this historiographical uh, location in Mount Street where they're trying to put right um, the, 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 the Catholic history, but partly also from the, the canonization process. And um, yes, it, it's, uh, maybe it uncomfortably mixes, but certainly you know, it, it, it captures the one thing which I think is, is good there. It captures Campion's sort of chivalry. I think that's, that certainly comes through. What, uh, the other big pity I have is, regret I have is that he neglected some sources which were available to him, uh, and I'm not quite sure why he did that. So, for example, with the capture at Life at Grange, which occupies 10 out of 60 chapters in uh, Bombino's biography, uh, and Bombino had access to a first-hand manuscript of one of the servants of Mrs. Yate. So he had a, you know, moment to moment. And, uh, for example, he describes the moment when um, George Eliot, the, the manic um, persevant, coming down the stairs, says, has anybody tapped that wall? And he sees the face of the servant who Mrs. Yate has put to be his minder go white. And he says, have that war. Now, war didn't look at that manuscript, didn't look at Bombino. So he didn't have that. 
and he didn't pick up the fact that there was this tension between the Berkshire Light Infantry or Berkshire Light Horse, who were the 50 soldiers provided, and George Eliot himself. There was obviously, and most of the Berkshire Light Horse would have been relatives or friends of Mrs. Yates. So trying not to find the priest. But that's not evident because War, in an incredible footnote, one of the notes which luckily disappeared from the third edition, says uh, there's no reason to mistrust this man. The, 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 the paid informant of the state who was paid 100 pounds in September for his evidence. So, um, but I agree with you, it, it, it's, it's a melange of, of things. But I think the, I still think the, the, the best bit carries it through. Um, and uh, I mean, it, but it doesn't, it doesn't do as a, a, as a whole biography or a portrait of the Elizabethan period. It does make an A1 convent prize. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I'm just, um, thanks, thanks for those, uh, those comments and questions. So I'm just looking at the uh, comments. Uh, apologies for those who haven't been able to hear some of the uh, audience's questions. Hopefully we can rectify that. Uh, one simple question uh, from Joe Simmons. Do you know, uh, Jared, the reason why War was originally interested in doing a biography of Gregory the Great? No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was rather randomly plucked from the bucket, I think. <laughs> uh, uh, and another, another question... Um, do you know the best biography of Evelyn War? I suppose you could read your way through all of the uh, the uh, complete works when they're finally published. But um, well, I must be tactful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, there's the two-volume Martin Stannard, uh, which is a very, very good starting point, and. Uh, and then there's Selina Hastings. I, I find that very, very good. Um, and again, reads very well and is, I think, gives a very broad picture, particularly more on his relationships, really, I think. And then the Philippide one uh, is, I think, also good. The recent, it's called Life Revisited, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so I think those, those are the three. I don't know whether Barbara's got any, or Henry. We should point out that Martin Stannard is one of our executive editors on the War Project. So, That's right. That's right. <laughs> um, was... but be that as it may, I mean that is, I would say, the most detailed. Um, you know, it's a two-volume thing. So, if you want absolutely everything, then read the Stannard. If you want a very narrative, but also very, very well-researched and informed biography, I, I would say the Hastings. Um, there's quite a few um, studies that are biographical, but then mix in other things. So it's a biography, but with a particular focus. So Michael Brennan's um, Fictions, Faith and Family. So if you're particularly interested in the sort of Catholic elements of his life, that's a good one. And um, I actually, um, Paula Byrne is a really, um, she's a very fluent writer. So Evelyn War and the Secrets of Brideshead, if you're um, you know, he's a really, really good read as well. Um, did, have I missed anything, Henry? Um, uh, <laughs> um, no, I don't think so. No, I think that, I think that, that, does it, that says it very well. I'm really sorry if we have missed someone. Oh, Douglas Lane Patey, actually. Um, yes, his, um, I can't remember what that subtitle, but Douglas Lane Patey um, has some really fascinating stuff in his biography on the concept of vocation. Um, so, so that's definitely worth a look as well. Great. Well, thanks. Any any final questions, uh, perhaps from our audience here in, in the library? Could, could you dedicate the book to uh, um, Art Darcy? So, Pro Professor Gavin Flood's asking, did uh, War dedicate the book to Father Darcy? Yes, it is, to, to Martin Darcy, Master of Campion Hall. And, um, and then he has to change that as time goes on, you know, to former Master of Campion Hall and so on. But um, yes, it, it, it's very much still a dedicated to Darcy. And um, of course, he was also. Uh, all the royalties forever go to Campion Hall, in fact. 
So we have a significant we fact. <laughs> But he, it was very funny in the American edition. Uh, it didn't. It only mistake it made was that somebody, uh, whom Moore called some ignorant person in your employment, uh, had put inverted commas around "Blessed Edmund Campion" or quotation marks around it, "Blessed Edmund Campion," and he was uh, asked them to get rid of this nasty error. That's right. Uh, but you know, it was nothing compared to the nasty errors to come in 1947. So. Um, Good. Well, I think that's perhaps a good moment to, to end this evening. Thank you again, Gerard, for a, a very enlightening and rich uh, narrative about Evelyn Waugh, his book on Edmund Campion, and multiple other interweaving narratives. Uh, to those of you here and online, thank you for joining us. And please do keep an eye on what's happening during this celebratory year, which we've begun today. Uh, amongst other things, we have Peter Davidson talking about uh, Robert Southerl. He's responsible for uh, the new complete works of Robert Southerl, which is a, a multi-year project, no doubt, but will be, um, uh, that will be a very interesting Campion lecture coming up. We also have a Newman lecture on Campion Day, the 1st of December, on human rights by Professor Linda Hogan from Trinity College. Um, we have other events happening throughout the year. So please do keep an eye on what's coming. Uh, Jared's uh, edition of uh, War's biography of Edmund Campion with OUP will be coming out probably around next spring. Uh, with we hope. The, we hope. <laughs> <laughs> you may piously hope. With, uh, with Jared's uh, introduction and, and commentary, which includes a lot of biographical detail of war because the history of the book through the six editions is so uh, can only be understood through that, that history, of you, as you've explained so well. Uh, a handful of dust, hopefully, that uh, Henry will be publishing will be coming out around the same time, uh, we hope. Um, so thanks again, Gerard, and um, Thank have, you a, have a good evening, everybody. Yeah. Thank you very much. I'd just like to end by recording my thanks to Wilma Minty, who organized these wonderful photographs by Colin Dunn, uh, which have substantially added to my pleasure in this anyway, I hope to your pleasure. Uh, and he seems a very good at bringing out some of the features of a book and, and indeed of this Arnu stay, which I've seen more clearly through his photograph than in real life. So thank you. <laughs>